This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot org. Recording by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri. In December 2005. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 9. Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room, and in the morning had the pleasure of being able to send a tolerable answer to the inquiries which she very early received from Mr. Bingley by a housemaid, and some time afterwards from the two elegant ladies who waited on his sisters. In spite of this amendment, however, she requested to have a note sent to Longbourn, desiring her mother to visit Jane, and form her own judgment of her situation. The note was immediately dispatched, and its contents as quickly complied with. Mrs. Bennet, accompanied by her two youngest girls, reached Netherfield soon after the family breakfast. Had she found Jane in any apparent danger, Mrs. Bennet would have been very miserable, but being satisfied on seeing her that her illness was not alarming, she had no wish of her recovering immediately, as her restoration to health would probably remove her from Netherfield. She would not listen, therefore, to her daughter's proposal of being carried home. Neither did the apothecary, who arrived about the same time, think it at all advisable. After sitting a little while with Jane, on Miss Bingley's appearance and invitation, the mother and three daughters all attended her into the breakfast parlor. Bingley met them with hopes that Mrs. Bennet had not found Miss Bennet worse than she expected. "'Indeed I have, sir,' was her answer. "'She is a great deal too ill to be moved. Mr. Jones says we must not think of moving her. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness.' "'Removed?' cried Bingley. "'It must not be thought of. My sister, I am sure, will not hear of her removal. You may depend upon it, madam, said Miss Bingley, with cold civility, that Miss Bennet will receive every possible attention while she remains with us. Mrs. Bennet was profuse in her acknowledgments. I am sure, she added, if it was not for such good friends, I do not know what will become of her, for she is very ill indeed, and suffers a vast deal though with the greatest patience in the world, which is always the way with her, for she was, without exception, the sweetest temper I have ever met with. I often tell my other girls they are nothing to her. You have a sweet room here, Mr. Bingley, and a charming prospect over the gravel walk. I do not know a place in the country that is equal to Netherfield. You will not think of quitting it in a hurry, I hope, though you have but a short lease." "'Whatever I do is done in a hurry,' replied he, "'and therefore, if I should resolve to quit Netherfield, "'I should probably be off in five minutes. "'At present, however, I consider myself as quite fixed here.' "'That is exactly what I should have supposed of you,' said Elizabeth. "'You begin to comprehend me, do you?' cried he, turning towards her. "'Oh, yes, I understand you perfectly.' "'I wish I might take this for a compliment.' "'but to be so easily seen through, I am afraid, is pitiful. "'That is as it happens. "'It does not follow that a deep, intricate character "'is more or less estimable than such a one as yours. "'Lizzie,' cried her mother, "'remember where you are and do not run on in the wild manner "'that you are suffered to do at home. "'I did not know before,' continued Bingley immediately, "'that you were a studier of character. "'It must be an amusing study.' "'Yes, but intricate characters are the most amusing. "'They have at least that advantage.' "'The country,' said Darcy, "'can in general supply but a few subjects for such a study. "'In a country neighborhood you move in a very confined and unvarying society. "'But people themselves alter so much "'that there is something new to be observed in them forever. "'Yes, indeed,' cried Mrs. Bennet, "'offended by his manner of mentioning a country neighborhood. I assure you there is quite as much of that going on in the country as in town. Everybody was surprised, and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. 
Mrs. Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, continued her triumph. I cannot see that London has any great advantage over the country, for my part, except the shops and public places. The country is a vast deal pleasanter, is it not, Mr. Bingley? When I am in the country, he replied, I never wish to leave it, and when I am in town, it is pretty much the same. They have each their advantages, and I can be equally happy in either. Ay, that is because you have the right disposition, but that gentleman— looking at Darcy, seemed to think the country was nothing at all. "'Indeed, Mamma, you are mistaken,' said Elizabeth, blushing for her mother. "'You quite mistook Mr. Darcy. He only meant that there was not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in the town, which you must acknowledge to be true.' "'Certainly, my dear, nobody said there were, but as to not meeting with many people in this neighbourhood, I believe there are few neighbourhoods larger.' I know we dine with four-and-twenty families. Nothing but concern for Elizabeth could enable Bingley to keep his countenance. His sister was less delicate and directed her eyes towards Mr. Darcy with a very expressive smile. Elizabeth, for the sake of saying something that might turn her mother's thoughts, now asked her if Charlotte Lucas had been at Longbourn since her coming away. Yes, she called yesterday with her father. "'What an agreeable man Sir William is, Mr. Bingley, is he not he? "'So much the man of fashion, so genteel and easy. "'He had always something to say to everybody. "'That is my idea of good breeding, "'and those persons who fancy themselves very important "'and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. "'Did Charlotte dine with you? "'No, she would go home. "'I fancy she was wanted about the mince-pies.' For my part, Mr. Bingley, I always keep servants that can do their own work. My daughters are brought up very differently. But everybody is to judge for themselves, and the Lucases are a very good sort of girls, I assure you. It is a pity they are not handsome. Not that I think Charlotte so very plain, but then she is our particular friend. She seems a very pleasant young woman. Oh, dear, yes, but you must own she is very plain. Lady Lucas herself has often said so and envied me Jane's beauty. I do not like to boast of my own children, but, to be sure, Jane, one does not often see anybody better looking. It is what everybody says. I do not trust my own partiality. When she was only fifteen, there was a man at my brother Gardiner's in town, so much in love with her, that my sister-in-law was sure he would make her an offer before we came away. But, however, he did not. Perhaps he thought her too young." However, he wrote some verses on her, and very pretty they were. And so ended his affection, said Elizabeth impatiently. There have been many a one, I fancy, overcome in the same way. I wonder who first discovered the efficacy of poetry in driving away love. I have been used to consider poetry as the food of love, said Darcy. Oh, a fine, stout, healthy love it may. Everything nourishes what is strong already. "'but if it be only a slight, thin sort of inclination, "'I am convinced that one good sonnet will starve it entirely away.' "'Darcy only smiled, and the general pause which ensued "'made Elizabeth tremble, lest her mother should be exposing herself again. "'She longed to speak, but could think of nothing to say, "'and after a short silence Mrs. Bennet began repeating her thanks "'to Mr. Bingley for his kindness to Jane, "'with an apology for troubling him also with Lizzie.' Mr. Bingley was unaffectedly civil in his answer, and forced his younger sister to be civil also, and say what the occasion required. She performed her part, indeed, without much graciousness, but Mrs. Bennet was satisfied, and soon afterwards ordered her carriage. Upon this signal, the youngest of her daughters put herself forward. The two girls had been whispering to each other during the whole visit, and the result of it was— that the youngest should tax Mr. Bingley with having promised on his first coming into the country to give a ball at Netherfield. Lydia was a stout, well-grown girl of fifteen, with a fine complexion and good-humoured countenance, a favourite with her mother, whose affection had brought her into public at an early age. She had high animal spirits, and a sort of natural self-consequence, which the attention of the officers— to whom her uncle's good dinners 
and her own easy manners recommended her, had increased into assurance. She was very equal, therefore, to address Mr. Bingley on the subject of the ball, and abruptly reminded him of his promise, adding that it would be the most shameful thing in the world if he did not keep it. His answer to this sudden attack was delightful to their mother's ear. "'I am perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement, and when your sister is recovered, you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. But you would not wish to be dancing when she is ill.' Lydia declared herself satisfied. "'Oh, yes, it would be much better to wait till Jane was well, and by that time most likely Captain Carter would be at Meryton again. And when you have given your ball,' she added, "'I shall insist on their giving one also. I shall tell Colonel Forster. It will be quite a shame if he does not.' Mrs. Bennet and her daughters then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane, leaving her own and her relations' behaviour to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr. Darcy, the latter of whom, however, could not be prevailed on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bingley's witticisms on fine eyes. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The day passed much as the day before had done, Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley had spent some hours of the morning with the invalid, who continued, though slowly, to mend, and in the evening Elizabeth joined their party in the drawing-room. The loo table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter, and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hurst and Mr. Bingley were at piquet, and Mrs. Hurst was observing their game. Elizabeth took up some needlework, and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady, either on his handwriting, or on the evenness of his lines, or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with which her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue, and was exactly in union with her opinion of each. "'How delightful Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter!' He made no answer. "'You write uncommonly fast. You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. "'How many letters you must have occasion to write in the course of a year! Letters of business, too! How odious I should think them!' It is fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of yours. Pray, tell your sister that I long to see her. I have already told her so once, by your desire. I am afraid you do not like your pen. Let me mend it for you. I mend pens remarkably well. Thank you, but I always mend my own. How can you contrive to write so even? He was silent. Tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table, and I think it infinitely superior to Miss Grantley's. Will you give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present I have not room to do them justice. Oh, it is of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy? They are generally long, but whether always charming, it is not for me to determine. It is a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. That will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother, because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables. Do you not, Darcy? My style of writing is very different from yours. Oh, cried Miss Bingley. Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words and blots the rest. My ideas flow so rapidly that I have not time to express them, by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondence. Your humility, Mr. Bingley, said Elizabeth, must disarm reproof. Nothing is more deceitful, said Darcy, than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion, and sometimes an indirect boast. 
And which of the two do you call my little recent piece of modesty? The indirect boast, for you are really proud of your defects in writing, because you consider them as proceeding from a rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimable, you think at least highly interesting. The power of doing anything with quickness is always prized much by the possessor, and often without any attention to the imperfection of the performance. When you told Mrs. Bennet this morning that if you ever resolved upon quitting Netherfield, you should be gone in five minutes, you meant it to be a sort of panegyric, of compliment to yourself. And yet, what is there so very laudable in a precipitance which must leave very necessary business undone, and can be of no real advantage to yourself or any one else? Nay, cried Bingley, this is too much, to remember at night all the foolish things that were said in the morning. And yet, upon my honour, I believe what I said of myself to be true, and I believe it at this moment. At least, therefore, I did not assume the character of needless precipitance merely to show off before the ladies. I dare say you believed it, but I am by no means convinced that you would be gone with such celerity. Your conduct would be quite as dependent on chance as that of any man I know, and if, as you were mounting your horse, a friend were to say, Bingley, you had better stay till next week. You would probably do it. You would probably not go, and at another word might stay a month. You have only proved by this, cried Elizabeth, that Mr. Bingley did not do justice to his own disposition. You have shown him off now much more than he did himself. I am exceedingly gratified, said Bingley, by your converting what my friend says into a compliment on the sweetness of my temper but I am afraid you are giving it a turn which that gentleman did by no means intend, for he would certainly think better of me if under such a circumstance I were to give a flat denial and ride off as fast as I could. When Mr. Darcy then consider the rashness of your original intentions as atoned for by your obstinacy in adhering to it? Upon my word, I cannot exactly explain the matter. Darcy must speak for himself. You expect me to account for opinions which you choose to call mine, but which I have never acknowledged. Allowing the case, however, to stand according to your representation, you must remember, Miss Bennet, that the friend who is supposed to desire his return to the house, and the delay of his plan, has merely desired it, asked it without offering one argument in favor of its propriety. To yield readily? easily to the persuasion of a friend is no merit with you to yield without conviction is no compliment to the understanding of either you appear to me mr darcy to allow nothing for the influence of friendship and affection a regard for the requester would often make one readily yield to a request without waiting for arguments to reason one into it i am not particularly speaking of such a case as you have supposed about mr bingley we may as well wait, perhaps, till the circumstance occurs, before we discuss the discretion of his behavior thereupon. But, in general, and ordinary cases between friend and friend, where one of them is desired by the other to change a resolution of no very great moment, should you think ill of that person for complying with desire, without waiting to be argued into it? Will it not be advisable, before we proceed on this subject, to arrange with rather more precision the degree of importance which is to appertain to this request, as well as the degree of intimacy subsisting between the parties. By all means, cried Bingley, let us hear all the particulars, not forgetting their comparative height and size, for that will have more weight in the argument, Miss Bennet, than you may be aware of. I assure you that if Darcy were not such a great tall fellow, in comparison with myself, I should not pay him half so much deference. I declare I do not know a more awful object than Darcy, on particular occasions, and in particular places, at his own house especially, and of a Sunday evening, when he has nothing to do. Mr. Darcy smiled, but Elizabeth thought she could perceive that he was rather offended, and therefore checked her laugh. Miss Bingley warmly resented the indignity he had received in an expostulation with her brother for talking such nonsense. "'I see your design, Bingley,' said his friend. 
you dislike an argument and want to silence this. Perhaps I do. Arguments are too much like disputes. If you and Miss Bennet will defer yours till I am out of the room, I shall be very thankful, and then you may say whatever you like of me. What you ask, said Elizabeth, is no sacrifice on my side, and Mr. Darcy had much better finish his letter. Mr. Darcy took her advice, and did finish his letter. When that business was over, he applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth for an indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved with some alacrity to the pianoforte, and, after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way, which the other, as politely and more earnestly, negatived, she seated herself. Mrs. Hurst sang with her sister, and while they were thus employed, Elizabeth could not help observing, as she turned over some music books that lay on the instrument, how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that she could be an object of admiration to so great a man, and yet that he should look at her because he disliked her was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, at last, that she drew his notice because there was something more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care for his approbation. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scottish air, and soon afterwards Mr. Darcy, drawing near Elizabeth, said to her, "'Do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to seize such an opportunity of dancing a reel?' She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question, with some surprise at her silence. "'Oh!' said she, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste. But I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes, and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have therefore made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare. Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry, but there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner which made it difficult for her to affront anybody, and Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. Miss Bingley saw, or suspected enough, to be jealous, and her great anxiety for the recovery of her dear friend Jane received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest by talking of their supposed marriage and planning his happiness in such an alliance. "'I hope,' said she, as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, you will give your mother-in-law a few hints when this desirable event takes place as to the advantage of holding her tongue, and if you can compass it, do sure the younger girls of running after officers, and, if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavor to check that little something bordering on conceit and impertinence which your lady possesses. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? Oh, yes! Do let the portraits of your uncle and aunt Phillips be placed in the gallery at Pemberley. Put them next to your great uncle the judge. They are in the same profession, you know, only in different lines. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not have it taken, for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes? It would not be easy, indeed, to catch their expression, but their color and shape and the eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. At that moment they were met from another walk by Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth herself. "'I did not know that you intended to walk,' said Miss Bingley, in some confusion, lest they had been overheard. "'You used us abominably ill,' answered Mrs. Hurst, running away without telling us that you were coming out. Then, taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness, and immediately said, 
This walk is not wide enough for our party. We had better go into the avenue. But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. Goodbye. She then ran gaily off, rejoicing as she rambled about, in the hope of being at home again in a day or two. Jane was already so much recovered as to intend leaving her room for a couple of hours that evening. End of chapter 10